our discussion with enzyme kinetics. In the subsequent two lectures, we will be looking at enzyme inhibition. In the previous lectures, we looked at how substrates bind to enzymes, in what fashion they bind in form the formation of an enzyme substrate complex that then subsequently led to the product. We also looked at the possibility of two substrates binding to the enzyme where we could have a sequential manner or a random manner binding and also at a ping pong type of reaction. The specific methodologies where substrates could bind to enzymes involved in most cases non-covalent interactions, but we also saw examples of covalent interactions between the enzyme and the substrate, which subsequently led to hydrolysis and other types of rearrangements that would lead us back to our original enzyme for it being ready to bind to another substrate. In this lecture, we will be looking at the specifics of inhibition and what we mean by the different types of inhibition that enzyme inhibitors could be involved in. In the case we will look, be looking at, we will be looking at the different modes of inhibition and the kinetics associated with the enzyme inhibition. And in the subsequent class, we will be look, looking at specific examples of these types of inhibition that we are going to look at in this lecture. So when we look at enzyme inhibition, what does this term mean? The term means that the inhibition, inhibition of the activity of an enzyme is possible through the action of an inhibitor. And this process is enzyme inhibition. And we realize that the enzyme inhibitor is a molecule, therefore, that would bind to the enzyme and decrease its activity. We learned of the enzyme substrate complex formation when we have a single substrate bound to the enzyme in a pre-equilibrium step forming the enzyme substrate complex. Similarly, if we look at an enzyme inhibitor complex formation, this would mean that the inhibitor would disrupt the normal reaction pathway between an enzyme and a substrate because we realize that part of the enzyme has gone into binding the inhibitor. So we do not have enough of the enzyme to bind to the substrate to go through its catalytic reaction. So the enzyme inhibitors inhibit the rate of the activity and as the concentration of the inhibitors increases, the rate of enzyme activity would decrease because the enzyme would be inactivated by the inhibitor. This reduction in enzyme activity has beneficial properties. They may be used to kill specific, uh, to stop the activity of a specific enzyme to correct metabolic imbalance, or they may be drugs that would bind to the specific enzyme molecules. So what happens in this case is that the binding of an inhibitor will prevent the binding from either entering this active site or will hinder the enzyme from catalyzing its specific reaction. So we are looking now, interestingly, for something that is going to bind tightly to the enzyme, unlike a substrate bound to the enzyme, because we would like the enzyme substrate complex to be in a manner that would allow the formation of the product. But in this case, where we are looking at the specific inhibition of the enzyme activity, we would be looking for tight binding. For example, the antibiotic penicillin, this inhibits the transpeptidase enzyme. As we can see from the name, the transpeptidase enzyme that catalyzes the cross-linking of the bacterial cell wall. And in this case, as we saw in the enzyme kinetics uh, classes that we went through, this resembles the transition state for the reaction. So we can have the enzyme complementary to the substrate in this case that would result in tight binding, which would not allow the reaction to proceed. So what happens is the enzyme substrate complex will be prevented from being formed and subsequently the product formation will be affected. For example, when we, we can look at this example where we have dihydrofolate reductase that is inhibited by methotrexate. Here, folic acid is the substrate. This 
marked in blue on the surface of the protein is the active site. Now, methotrexate has bound to the active site as a result of which the substrate cannot bind. So, we would need to know what kind of inhibition this is. So, the enzyme inhibition that we considered now indicates that there is a reduction in the rate of the enzymatic reactions. The action is specific and it can work at low concentrations, which is what would ideally be looked for in a design of an enzyme. And many drugs and poisons actually act as inhibitors of enzymes. So let us look at enzyme inhibition. We have different types of enzyme inhibitors in terms of reversible inhibitors. As the name implies, they are in, they interact through non-covalent interactions, mainly hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic and ionic bonds. An example is ritonavir, that is a reversible inhibitor of the HIV protease. The protease enzyme means that it is involved in the cleavage of specific polypeptide chains. So it creates an enzyme inhibitor complex that prevents the formation or prevents the cleavage of the specific polyproteins in HIV protease. We can also have irreversible inhibitors, and in irreversible inhibitors, the enzymes are permanently damaged by covalent bond formation, and an example would be diisopropyl fluorophosphate, which is a nerve gas that is an irreversible inhibitor that interacts in a covalent fashion with the serine at the active site of acetyl acetylcholinesterase to form a covalent bond, rendering the enzyme inactive. So, we have in the case of reversible inhibitors, we have competitive inhibition, non-competitive inhibition, uncompetitive inhibition. We will see what these three types of inhibition mean in terms of the kinetics, in terms of the specific michaelis menten values that we will try and observe. First, let us look at the enzyme kinetics, michaelis menten the typical velocity curves that are obtained in enzyme kinetics, where we plot the velocity of the reaction that we monitor in a specific way versus the substrate concentration. When there is no inhibitor, we know that we have a curve where we have first order type followed by second, uh, zero order, indicating that an increase in the concentration of the substrate is not going to affect the rate of the reaction because the enzyme active sites have been saturated with the substrate. So we reach a saturation. When we have a competitive inhibitor, which we will see what it means, but the name implies that it, it competes with the substrate to bind to the enzyme, we see that it reaches the same Vmax simply because the enzyme inhibitor complex in this case is a reversible complex formation that with a sufficient concentration of substrate, may reach the same Vmax. With a non-competitive inhibitor, which we will also see, this indicates that we have an inhibition, but the enzyme has been rendered ineffective so that even with increase in substrate concentration, we do not affect or we do not reach the same Vmax possible. So we have the three KM values associated with no inhibitor, competitive inhibitor, and non-competitive inhibitor and we know we are looking at half of Vmax in each case to determine the Km values that are shown here. Now when we look at competitive inhibition as the name implies our inhibitor looks like the substrate as it binds to the active site. So we have here an enzyme substrate complex, here we have an enzyme inhibitor and we have to subsequently look at the kinetics involved and we know that we would have an enzyme substrate complex to form the product. However, in the presence of the inhibitor, we are going to have an additional complex formation where we would have an EI formed. Now, this means once the enzyme inhibitor complex is formed in a competitive inhibition, the substrate is unable to bind to the enzyme inhibitor complex, indicating that there would be no further reaction to form the product. What has been marked here is a value Ki that is a measure of the dissociation constant. You can see in which 
part of b so we are looking at a dissociation constant that tells us how tight the inhibitor has bound to our enzyme so the inhibitor in this case binds only to the enzyme and we have expressions related to our michaelis menten kinetics where we have we will see or as we saw in the previous graph also the same v banks attained because we realize that if we add sufficient substrate this reaction may go in this direction and we may have the product formation but our km value is affected so we have an alpha value attached to the km indicating that there is a variation from the original km value due to the competitive inhibition if we look at the line weaver burke double reciprocal plot now we will see that we have a specific indication where our y intercept we know is 1 by v max which we will see an intersection of the two lines where the blue line here indicates no inhibitor and the red line here indicates the reaction or the plot with inhibitor the 1 by v versus 1 by s which is our line weaver burk plot in the original case we had 1 by km value now we have an inhibitor concentration and an dissociation constant the ki value or the inhibition constant associated with the inhibitor that is going to give us a modified michaelis constant in non competitive inhibition what happens is the enzyme substrate complex is formed and the enzyme inhibitor complex may also be formed interestingly in this case we have the formation of a ternary complex indicating that if the enzyme substrate is bound then if we bind the inhibitor we will have a complex that has the substrate and the inhibitor bound and we realize that the inhibitor does not this is the active site of the enzyme the inhibitor does not bind to the active site of the enzyme rather binds to its own uh, uh, its own site that is a non competitive inhibition once this ternary complex is formed this can no longer form the product so we have here an e plus i and also an es plus i so in this case we will have no reaction in the formation of the ternary complex and the inhibitor in this case because it does not bind to the competitive or the active site it may bind to the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex because the point at which the inhibitor binds is free so we again have a modified michaelis menten kinetics where here apart from the modified alpha km we will also have a alpha prime s that corresponds to the substrate concentration and the alpha km indicates that the presence there is a presence of the inhibitor so when we look at our line weaver burk plot that gives us the specific Uh, conditions here we will see that the vmax is different from the one that has no inhibitor but the km value is saying indicating that any enzyme that is available for the reaction would go forward to form the product and we can have uncompetitive inhibition in uncompetitive inhibition what happens is we have the enzyme substrate complex formed and the inhibitor can only bind to the enzyme substrate complex and not the enzyme alone but nevertheless it would inhibit the activity of the enzyme so we have in this case a specific condition where we have the ternary complex followed by the esi formation but it does not bind to the enzyme alone only after the enzyme substrate is formed does the inhibitor bind to this to form the ternary complex so the inhibitor binds to es forming this ternary complex we have the modified equation for the michaelis menten kinetics and when we look at our line weaver burk plot we will see that we have parallel lines in the case of uncompetitive inhibitors because we have this binding to only the enzyme substrate complex but we realize that if the enzyme substrate complex has an inhibitor bound to it we cannot have our desired product formation 
So if we look at the schemes for the modes of inhibition in general and have a look at all the possibilities, we will see that we have, say, an E plus S going to an ES. Here we have looked at the dissociation constant in the terms of KS going from ES back to the enzyme and substrate. And we have a, the small KP indicates a specific rate constant that is going to take the enzyme substrate complex to form the product. We have now the inhibitor addition. The inhibitor we saw in the different modes can bind to the enzyme and can also bind to the enzyme substrate complex. So we will see a situation where we can have an ESI. So we can have an EI plus an S that would give us a ternary complex or we could have an ES, ES plus an I that would also give us a ternary complex. If we now look at the whole scheme of the matter and it may so happen that there may be in several cases because no particular inhibition substrate analog that would look like a substrate a competitive inhibitor would it would follow say this pattern only then we could have a non-competitive inhibitor that would follow a different scheme in the overall scheme of the kinetics that has been shown here for a single substrate binding However, there may be cases where we could have a modification of this rate and still form a product with the enzyme bound to the inhibitor. There are cases that are possible. So, this is a general kinetic model for the interaction for all types of inhibitors where we have the enzyme, we have the substrate, we have the inhibitor, and we have the product. So, if we look at our general scheme of things like we showed, this is our overall scheme. Now, what is the information we can get from this scheme and how does it help us? First, we can find out what the Ks value is. That is the equilibrium constant associated with the dissociation of our enzyme substrate complex. We have the alpha Ks value where this is the dissociation of the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex. So we have this formation. Now when we look at the, so this is this formation going in this direction where these are our products and by the law of mass action we start off with this. We also have a Ki value that is associated with the dissociation of the enzyme inhibitor complex which is given which is by far the most sought after inhibition constant value that gives us an indication of how effective our inhibitor is. We have the alpha Ki value which is associated again with the enzyme substrate inhibitor ternary complex but this case it breaks up into this particular. So in the initial case that we are looking at the alpha Ks we are looking at the ternary complex breaking up into the enzyme inhibitor complex and the substrate. In the alpha Ki set, we are looking at the enzyme substrate inhibitor ternary complex breaking into the enzyme substrate complex and the inhibitor. And if there is any methodology that can go to monitor the concentrations of the enzyme substrate complex or the inhibitor or the formation of the product, this will be used to determine the values of alpha and beta in the reactions. So the Kp that we have is the rate constant for the breakdown of ES2 E plus P in the reaction and the beta Kp is the rate constant for the breakdown of the ESI 2P that may be possible in several cases. A case of mixed inhibition now indicates that sometimes in uncompetitive inhibition where we saw that the inhibitor bound to the enzyme substrate complex, it forms a non-productive ESI complex. However, it may so happen in a mixed inhibition where this is known as an inhibition in which the EI that is formed has a lower affinity for the substrate compared to the enzyme. So we know that when we have the enzyme binding to the substrate, there has to be a strong affinity 
a strong recognition for the substrate to bind to the enzyme. Once we have the inhibitor bound to the enzyme, then the in enzyme inhibitor complex is formed. Whether this inhibitor binds to the active site of the protein in a competitive mode of inhibition or whether it binds to a different site in a non-competitive mode of inhibition. In, uncompet in the uncompetitive type, we found that the enzyme substrate complex is formed and the inhibitor binds to this complex. However, there may be cases for our non-competitive type where the enzyme inhibitor formed will now have less affinity for the substrate and will not be able to form the ternary complex to the extent desired. This is a linear type of mixed inhibition. We will see what the graphs look like. So this is what happens. This is when we have the ESI complex that is non-productive in nature and the values of the alpha and the beta associated with the scheme of the inhibition that was described previously gives us a set where the intersection is not on the y-axis as was for a competitive inhibitor, not on the x-axis as was seen for a non-competitive inhibitor. It is not even parallel as was seen for an uncompetitive inhibitor, but an intersection around here indicating that we have a mixture of competitive and uncompetitive inhibition. Similarly, we can have another possibility when the inhibitor increases the rate constant for the product formation and decreases the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate, which indicates that the inhibitor is working on the enzyme in a manner that it does not allow it to bind the substrate, but nevertheless allows, pushes it in a way where we can consider the alpha less than the beta and the alpha, the alpha less than one and the beta less than one and the alpha greater than the beta in our description in the schemes of modes of inhibition where we looked at the alpha products with the different constants, the beta products with the Kp value that is the rate constant for the formation of the product and this type of character is inhibited is exhibited in a type of hyperbolic partial competitive inhibition, where there is partial competitive inhibition in the sense that the, in, the inhibitor is binding to the substrate. So we realize that there may be several variations in terms of the binding to the, of the inhibitor to the enzyme that affects the substrate binding in different ways. Allosteric inhibition, is where we have the binding to the active site. We have an allosteric site. This is the scheme of things where we have the substrate that binds to the active site where it is supposed to go. However, a binding of an inhibitor to an allosteric site alters the active site shape and shape complementarity and then it has an altered active site that cannot bind the substrate anymore, giving us an inhibition. Another very interesting inhibition is feedback inhibition. In this case, what happens is th there, are seven, there are a series of a cascade of reactions that form, say we have threonine as the substrate, and the final product is isoleucine. In this beautiful natural way of inhibition, the substrate acts to uh, binds to the active site as would be essential in an example of a threonine deaminase. We have a series of reactions where we have different intermediates from intermediate A, B, C, D that involves several different other substrates. However, isoleucine acts at an allosteric site of threonine deaminase. What happens therefore, it changes the shape of the active site and the active site can no longer bind threonine, which means that the final end product of this series of reactions will bind to the initial enzyme, enzyme 1, thus preventing its own formation. 
This happens when the concentration, for example, in this particular case, the enzyme would be inhibited, enzyme 1. So there is no reason to inter... Because then if we go and inhibit enzyme 2, it means intermediate A would have been formed. But for that not to form, isoleucine, which is the end product, is an allosteric inhibitor for the first enzyme in the series of reactions. So it prevents its own formation when the concentration of this product is high. It is a beautiful way to control, to balance the formation of products. And very smartly, it goes to the first enzyme in the series. So threonine may be used elsewhere. And we do not have these intermediates in the middle. And enzyme 2, enzyme 3, enzyme 4 or 5 are not in it. So what we looked at in this lecture is competitive inhibition, non-competitive inhibition, uncompetitive mix, and feedback inhibition. These are all the different types of ways in which enzymes can be inhibited. And we have, the these are the reversible types mostly. We also have the irreversible types, as we saw, where we have covalent bond formation. And we will look at specific examples in the next lecture. These are the books that have been followed. Thank you.